I forget. Course, yeah. Um, I'm also going to try something I've never done before, which is recording. Hmm. Is it recording? Uh, yes, I believe so. Okay. I just want to make sure that it's recording. It okay. is recording. Yeah, I think we're good. Floor. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, to be really honest, um, from my side, I've really, really messed up in a lot of ways as being a friend and family member with other people in my life who who have had loss. And, and so having this conversation with you, I have so much to learn. I'm constantly learning. Um, but especially when it comes to grief, just grief in general, um, I know for me, it's, it's a constant learning curve and I've messed up in a lot of ways. And so I want to be really sensitive. Um, but in the same way, I don't really know. I don't really have any questions, right? Like I don't have any questions. I usually come in a little prepared with questions, but I just am. So I feel like this is a topic that is so big, but yet so important. And so are you okay? Just like letting it flow and however it transpires rather than me having like some premeditated <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'm happy to start and share my story and just kind of give people a background of who I am and <clears throat> what really makes me who I am. And oh, awesome. I, I do everything I do. Oh, so. thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So, um, okay. Yeah. So, we're going to like rewind to the year 1999, 2000. And it was March 23rd of 2000. I gave birth to my first baby. And unfortunately, she died when I was full term. She died on her due date. And I had no complications, no risks in the pregnancy. I got married while I was pregnant. Um, I really thought I did everything right. And the baby died due to a cord accident. So an umbilical cord around the baby's neck as she descended into my pelvis in early labor. Nothing I could have done. Supposedly, this happens to 1% of women in America, which is about 100,000 women a year, sadly. Um, and, and I gave birth to a dead baby. So it was very difficult physically, emotionally, spiritually. My family was there with me. Um, it really, really shook me, you know, giving birth is hard enough. Yeah. And then going in and knowing that your baby was gone, you don't get your prize at the end. So Oh, yeah, it was really, really tough. So, you know, I think it's a really important topic to talk about because it is a little taboo. And, you know, here in the US, I don't feel like people are comfortable talking about loss and definitely not pregnancy loss. Um, you know, there are different kinds of losses. Um, they classify a miscarriage as a loss prior to 20 weeks and a stillborn, stillborn after 20 weeks. Um, you know, to me, a loss is a loss, whether the woman loses a baby at four weeks or 40 weeks, that's her baby, that's her future. There's no discounting. I don't get extra kudos because I carried to term or anything. So, um, you know, there, there was a lot of grief, a lot of grief. I was so overwrought, like just even in the hospital and I was so heavily drugged and just, you know, going with the thing. And it was, vomiting and so the whole experience was not the most pleasant um and and my mom came from florida and she made it in time for the birth of my baby which was really profound for me and then my sister flew out from the east coast and they really helped to take care of me in terms of like helping me find uh, resources uh, which are really available to people and and hopefully you know people can look not only locally but now that we have the internet everything is virtual like I did a group called Empty Cradle uh, here locally in San Diego that I know now their groups are all virtual so it's like anybody could do these groups um, so and they are uh, lost groups for miscarriage, stillborn or infant death, like if somebody's baby, God forbid, dies of SIDS or, you know, whatever causes in the early stages, that group supports them all. Um, I also found a group called Maternal Connections that was here locally at San Diego Hospice. And it was wonderful. That was a paid group. And there was four women that had lost babies recently with two therapists. And it was very, very healing. 
It was a beautiful program. They taught me about heart rocks. I have heart rocks all over my life. I collect them like in nature and in um, people give them to me as gifts. So, oh, you know, it was, it was so cool because when I went to the support group, they had a basket of heart rocks and they would say, you have to pick a rock and tell us how you feel and why you chose a rock. So like, if I pick this rock because it's heavy, you know, or it's dark or um, some had cracks down it. And then in the end you're picking something like, you know, I feel, I feel lighter, like a little bit light, my heart, you know, something like that. So now I, I get heart rocks from everyone as gifts. And when I go hiking, I love it. It's, they're all over my yard. Every time I hike, I bring some back. Um, but that was healing for me. That was a little bit of a, of a thing that like helping me be connected. So, so I think that there's a lot of ways that women can deal with the grief of pregnancy loss, whether it is miscarriage or stillbirth. Um, but talking about their feelings is, is the number one thing is, you know, the worst thing that anybody can say to someone is, oh, you can have another baby. You know, like oh. so many people told me that. And that's if someone's mom died or their sister dies or their best friend dies, you don't say, Oh, you can get another one. You don't say that. You just don't. So I think that um, you know, I was very fortunate to be able to go on and have another child and to have a healthy pregnancy and to be able to give birth and for my baby to be healthy and you know, she's amazing, the light of my life. So I'm super grateful, but I, I really understand that feeling, that longing of like, you would do anything to have a baby, especially after having a loss. And, you know, there, there are so many components of it. Like if you want to talk about early loss, like your milk comes in, your milk still comes in, even if your baby dies. And so nobody talked to me about that. I never thought about that. Like, I thought that was like the cruelest joke nature could have played. And so, you know, people, I don't know how you prepare for that, but cabbage in the bra, <laughs> that's what I did. And, you know, anyways, it, it was challenging, but I found the most help talking to people and reaching out with the different groups. Um, some of my closest friends and family could not talk about it. And that was oh, really yeah. hurtful and sad. Like. I recall my father-in-law telling me I will not cry in his house a few days after I telling him. you or he telling himself no telling me my my husband and I had moved in just for a short period of time to recover there and a couple of days after burying my daughter he was like you will not cry at my house and I was just sobbing all day every day so oh yeah you know it's kind of that like oh I was bringing them down oh excuse me, I'm so sorry, you know, so um, it's hard, it's really hard, a lot of people just do not really know how to handle that, and they really don't want to handle it, and I think they just want to, like, they just want it over, you know, and, right, and it, it was very sad all day, every day, for a long period of time, and, you know, gradually, I'd have speckles of happiness, or a little bit of laughter, and it was like, well, I had a good hour or a good afternoon or something. And, you know, God bless my ex-husband. He stayed home with me for like four months. He was such a good, good man. And really being there for me emotionally, he, he wanted to like sit with me because I was, I was literally suicidal. Like I just wanted to die with my child. So it was a bad, bad time. And um, I was grateful. We went to empty cradle together. We went separately. I did the, um, I think it was a 10 or 12 week course with the hospice, which helped. And it started like two weeks after my loss. So that was really helpful. I had a therapist for years, you know, specializing in loss. And then I think, you know, one of the most healing things I did was to have a pregnancy after a loss and to go through it and to give birth and have a, my baby was sick in the beginning, but she's healthy now. And, you know, to have a healthy baby and a healthy mom, after giving birth and um yeah you know um after I gave birth to Lauren which 
was my second child. So my first baby was named Mia. And um, my Western medical doctors told me I could get pregnant three months after my full term loss. And Whoa. yeah, they were like, that's fine. And so my Chinese doctors told me to wait at least one year. And I was really desperate to have a baby. And so I didn't listen to my Chinese doctors. And I tried on that third month and we got pregnant. So I gave birth 54 weeks after a full term loss. And in Chinese medicine, they say the one way to wipe yourself out um, is to have too many babies too close together. And I did that. I definitely did that because it took me about three years to recover from that back to back pregnancy. And, you know, I'm actually my daughter's 19 years old now and moved out and I'm kind of finally getting around to taking care of my body um, all this time later because that was not addressed. And so that's something in my career that I've become extremely passionate about with birth and postpartum because I feel like there's a loss in our society. Like, you know, we're not talking about things like pregnancy loss. We're not talking about postpartum conditions. People are like, oh, you have a healthy baby. You know, and women are coming out of, of, of birth very traumatized and sad and you know, with PTSD. And, and so, you know, that's from the worst thing that's ever happened to me, losing this child um, has come the best thing, which is my career. And I've devoted the last 20 years to helping people through fertility, pregnancy, birth, postpartum, and feel like they have options, natural options with healthcare and you know, navigating hospital or healthcare systems with their birth, especially. So, um, so yeah. That's oh, kind thank of you so much for sharing. Um, I can, I can, I can still hear, you know, like when you speak about Mia, you can still, I can hear and I can feel the love and the loss all at the same time. And um, I guess that never really goes away, does it? No, yeah. no. Um, just doesn't, you know, like it gets better. Yeah. And some days are better than others. And, um, you know, I usually don't cry. Like, I feel like I can talk about it most times yeah. um, and be okay. But this is, you know, I'm only human. Like I did lose a child and it was my future. And, you know, I have a beautiful daughter that I'm so grateful is, is with me. But sometimes when people ask me, you know, do I have children? And I'll say, I have one in heaven and I have one here on earth with me. And uh, it's just my way of honoring the, the sweet soul that kind of passed through me. And I've always told my daughter, Lauren, about um, her sister, Mia. And we talked about her. And so it's kind of nice to be able to normalize it a lot of times people really get that swept under the rug like they're not supposed to talk about it not supposed to mention it and and I think one of the things that really help lost mamas is talking about their babies and to say their names and you know it's like beautiful to hear you say me so I'm sure all the other moms with loss or losses you know have similar feelings um yeah, I wish there was a way to normalize it. I wish there was more support or that women were able to find support when they have losses because it can devastate people, you know, uh, as wonderful as my husband was at the time, it kind of tore us apart and we wound up divorced a couple of years later. Um, so, you know, that, that, that can very well happen, whether that was a reason or just one of many, uh, whatever, you know, that was a long time ago. Um, but yeah, it can cause a lot of problems with oneself, like with your own, uh, like hatred of yourself, like feeling like you did something wrong when most of the time there's nothing that we could have done. There's absolutely nothing. And, um, you know, as an acupuncturist and someone who clinically has seen a lot of women it really makes me sad to hear about these women going through the traditional system because when they're having a loss at four, five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 weeks, there's nothing that they'll do. 
and the hospitals and the doctors and it's like okay well just you know go home and miscarry and these women are just like freaking distraught about that so I wish there was a way a better way of helping people and you know from from my perspective again through Chinese medicine it's, it's not just about getting pregnant it's about staying pregnant caring to term giving birth to a healthy baby and having a healthy mom it's right. not just like you have a healthy baby put a smile on your face and shut it you know like no <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> that's not right. Well, that's why we want to have these conversations, right? Is because we do see, we kind of have an insider outsider perspective, both being a patient ourselves, being moms ourselves, going through the process, and also one foot in, one foot out in, in medicine. We've chosen the rebel path, we've chosen the path less taken because the, the allopathic biomedical system doesn't necessarily meet everyone's needs in the way that they need to be met spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically. And that's exactly what I'm seeing, especially, you know, this is word for word. My clients are telling me, you know, the, the healthcare system is not set up to care for their emotional needs during birth, especially. And so, you know, I, I just, it's sad because you have one baby or 12 babies, you know, that first baby is often very traumatic for people in, in a, the traditional settings. And, you know, I, I just, I want to scream from the rooftops about <laughs> options and, and awareness and education and how, you know, people can learn these things. And it is really important that you learn it ahead of time, you know, not just going along with the plan and, you know, most people think they have to be a good patient. And, you know, like I said, I had a NICU nurse as a student the other day in my childbirth education. And she was telling me about a C-section that she had, and she feels like was completely unwarranted and just the way she felt. And, and she said, she felt like they treated her worse because she was in the system. They thought she would understand what happens in L and D she's you know in a different department so anyways so going into a second pregnancy after that you know a lot of times people have that bad first experience um before they realize they need to do something about it and so you know even with me like I I had a bad first experience as my baby died I also was so heavily medicated I had edema for six weeks because they just were like drugging me and I was vomiting and you know I I don't know if that was necessary or not. Anyways, um, you know, it's a long time later, but yeah, back to grief. Um, Yeah, there's, there's so many aspects of it too. Like, and I do think that it is different for some women if you have a miscarriage versus if you have a full-term loss. Um, One of my good friends runs that empty cradle group for miscarriage or one of them. And so, you know, she talked about things like people feeling guilty because they flush their baby down the toilet. Mm-hmm. Like they didn't know what to do with it and in the moment. And then they had mm-hmm. this grief forever. And, you know, so that wasn't my, you know, so it's like people have to do what they have to do and feel right. And, you know, and, and for me, I actually had a full term baby and she's actually buried in a cemetery that I can go visit. And it's sucks because I know that she's not there. Like it's just her physical body or spirit is with me. And, um, you know, and I wonder now she would be like 21 soon. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like, oh. like, 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 like and, you know, like I almost just still see her as this little tiny thing. Anyways. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And um, one of the things for, you know, anyone who's listening, who may have gone through their own loss, right? Um, I think hearing someone else's story is also healing. That's, you know, this is a big reason why I've, I feel really called to create the space is simply hearing other people's real stories, not their sugar-coated stories can be healing in itself because, anyone who has, is listening and has also gone through some form of uh, pregnancy loss, they'll, they'll feel you, they'll hear you, they'll see that you, and also begin to resonate in their own way, maybe towards a path of 
um, you know, their, their own process of mending. I'm, I'm very cautious to use the word healing because I think it gets overused sometimes, but, um, and to lean into community, I guess is what I'm saying is they're not alone. If you're listening and you're hearing Deb's story and you're feeling stuff come up, you're not alone. And in fact, um, there's quite a few, you know, like you said, the statistics seem low when you say 1%, but then you do the math and you're like, wow, that's a lot of people. And honestly, I know many, like to me, that seems so low when you said that. Cause I'm like, but I know so many women, how, like, that seems really low. So, um, whether it's miscarriage or loss or midterm or right after or a few days or a few weeks. I mean, it's out there and we don't talk about it. And, and that, that breaks my heart. That breaks my heart. And so um, for those who are listening, the, all the different ways, like, um, you know, online, like you said, what is something that if you're around the person, right? Like, so your mother, and you, if you can think back to your mother and your sister who are around you, what are some things that did support you that didn't feel like toxic positivity or spiritual bypassing? Because I know that that tends to happen, especially when people mm -hmm. don't mean to, but it is. So what were the things that, that meant the most mm -hmm. to you at that time? The things that, that meant the most was, so one, I was <clears throat> raised Jewish and in the Jewish tradition, there is something called sitting Shiva when a loved one dies and it's a one week of mourning. And it's only if it's your direct relative, like if my grandma dies, it's my mom who sits Shiva for her mom. I don't get to sit Shiva. It has to be like one connected. So it's only for your husband, your wife, your child, your, you know, <clears throat> mother, father, sister, brother kind of thing. And so my baby died and it's my first time in my life to sit Shiva. So I said to my mom, I want to sit Shiva for Mia. And um, she was like, well, I don't really know anything about it. So then I asked my stepmom, who's from Israel, and I thought she's the most Jewish person I know. Um, you know, I want to sit Shiva for my baby. And she came back to me the next day and said, because her baby was born dead in the Jewish religion, she didn't exist. So you don't get to sit Shiva for her. Oh, I'm sorry. And I was so distraught at that time that I just didn't have the energy or the mental capacity to research that or look into that. And I did post something about that on social media just a couple of years ago and the world was appalled because they say, you know, I could have done anything I wanted kind of thing. But anyways, my mother and I kind of sat Shiva. We did our own little thing for my daughter. And um, so I think finding a way to honor the baby and to be able to talk about the baby and cry with the mom and help her, you know, put away the baby things. Like there's a whole room of stuff now devoted to that. Everywhere I would go, people would touch my belly and when's the baby due? And I, and I just gave birth to it. So I'm here, I'm telling strangers in the supermarket, my life story and sobbing uncontrollably, like do not touch people's bellies and right. do not assume everything's fine. Right. Believe, right. Know, that's one piece of advice. Um, some of the things that I do to honor my child, I feel like maybe that can be helpful. Like Every year for her birthday, I buy myself something. Um, and so when I see butterflies, I think of her. And so anything that's a butterfly, like I have a butterfly necklace that I bought one year, or I would buy like a pink rose bush for my garden. So just little things like that. I used to let balloons fly, but now I'm want to be more of an environmentalist. I'm not going to do that. Yeah, my heart rocks. And um, I think really finding support, like my mom and my sister really helped me find a therapist, find support groups. There's so many groups online. There's support groups online, pregnancy support group after a loss. So it's one thing having the loss and going through that, but then to get pregnant and to do it again, takes balls, takes a lot of balls. And it's hard for people, really, really hard. And, you know, honestly, it's the same thing if somebody has any kind of birth trauma, their first baby, it's really like scary to want to do it again, you know, go through it again. Yeah. So are, are those resources on your website? If people are interested in looking at that or, um, you know, 
either personally or for someone in their community or family? Do you have those resources or do you know? Um, people could reach out to me directly. Okay. Um, you know, I, my email is Deb Davies, L-A-C at Gmail. Okay. Um, so that you can always email me. I find myself very much wanting to support lost mamas and I don't really care where they come from. Whenever I get the call or the email, I'm always kind of try to go above and beyond to, to have resources. And maybe that's a good idea to add a page on my website on loss. Um, but at the moment I don't have it set up, but I would, if somebody is looking for that, like, please reach out to me. And, yeah. Cause I'm also thinking as a clinician, right? So it's because of, uh, because of Mia that you became an acupuncturist. So from a clinician perspective, now supporting uh, pregnant bodies during, you know, in conceiving side on the infertility side and fertility side, all the way through prenatal and postnatal, I'm sure you have people coming back to you who have had their own loss. And so as um, I'd be just really curious from your perspective as a clinician, what is the best thing we can do as clinicians to hold that space? Because we're not trained in um, psychotherapy and, and I mean, some people might have dual degrees, but if you've just gone through acupuncture school or Chinese medicine school, you don't necessarily have that, um, that extensive training and scope of practice. So what are things that acupuncturists can do when they know that their patient is coming in with a loss? Uh, that is a really good question and, and very important. Um, being very empathetic is probably the number one thing. So I've seen women come into my clinic that are um, still pregnant and the baby died. And so it's like, they're kind of coming in to uh, help naturally promote the labor or, um, you know, people have, yeah, like, or they just went to the doctor and found out there's no heartbeat. So it's, um, yeah, I think being really empathetic, giving them time, like, I hope that you're not rocking three rooms at that time and you have a patient every 20 minutes because this person needs a little extra time. And if you have three rooms and you're doing two an hour, that would be ideal because, you know, you could come in and talk to them or greet them and bring them a hot pack or something comforting, but realize they might need 20 minutes to talk about this or cry about this or something like um, oftentimes. So in my practice, I mostly see OBGYN. So it's fertility patients coming in and having loss after loss and they're just sobbing. And so, you know, the thing that I find myself saying over and over and over is like, it's not just about getting pregnant. It's about staying pregnant, caring to term, giving birth, having a healthy baby and a healthy mom after that. So yeah. there's so much more to it than just getting pregnant. Yeah. And you're, and, and just to be clear, you're not saying that to the person in front of you, that client in front of you, that's more of your motto as a clinician is we need to think bigger out, not just about getting pregnant. Right. I will say that to the patient. Oh, you will. will. Okay. Say it in the loss moment, because, you know, a lot of times people are like, oh, I'm going for IVF next week. I'm going to see you one time before. And, you know, like, oh, yeah, I, I feel like the body, it takes time. You know, yeah. it takes about 120 days to rebuild a blood cell. So if we're preparing the palace mm -hmm. and they just want to stick baby in after baby in after IVF cycle, you know, without giving their bodies a chance to recover or whatever, like. I, I really don't care how people get pregnant or give birth. I feel like it's their birth, their babies, their bodies, their way. I just want to support them and knowing that they have these options. Yeah. Well, and to, I think what I hear you also say is um, open up that conversation to, to the bigger picture of it's mm -hmm. not just about caring because uh, there's a lot more after that. <laughs> there's a lot more and a lot more that we don't, um, talk about as, you know, I don't know, you grew up in, you grew, you said you grew up Jewish, but were you raised um, around um, images or did you see other people have births or was your birth the first birth? Like, how did you grow up? What was your experience birth with birthing? First birth. My yeah. birth, was my birth. So I had not seen a birth and, um, you know, I, 
it's like if people want to ask you ask me the question you know what is an acupuncturist going to say it's like you can ask if you held your baby if you had any time with your baby um if you got to kiss your baby dress your baby something like that Mm -hmm. when I was given my baby they said here you have five minutes with your baby and I got to hold her and like kiss her hello and goodbye and it was very um sad it was really really sad um and her jaw dropped open and so that was very um like what a realization and she had blue eyes and dark curly hair and she looked just like me so it was really um it was really challenging but I think that the hospitals nowadays are allowing them to have them overnight or whatever like you you don't have to just give them back right away so you know you can ask questions and I think it's just even if you cry with them it shows your human side my doctor cried with me I was the first loss that she had in all of her practice so she literally cried with me and was devastated too so like they're only human we're only human so it's okay if you cry and if you walk into your next patient all teary-eyed well, my last patient just lost a baby, you know, it, it seems reasonable, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's so, reality of life too, is I think, like you said, so many times it's trying, like, it's, I don't know where this comes from. I don't know. Maybe you have some insight is like, we hide it. We have to hide it. Is that shame? Right? Like, why, why are we hiding it? Why aren't we talking about it? right? There's so much going on. There's nothing to be shameful for, you know, like if anything, this is when we need community to come out and be there and friends to be there and not judge and just to hold space. And, and let's be honest, everyone's going to be different in what that means. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's amazing when you do have a loss and you start talking to your friends and your community, how many other women have also gone through it. And, um, you know, going through the support groups, some culture shamed the women like it was their mm-hmm. fault, completely shamed them. And they're just as devastated, if not more, than their husbands and they're and they're getting shamed. So, you know, I think just support, as much support as you can, resources, whether locally or globally, um, finding finding resources. And and I think especially if this is a fertility patient, you you really have to educate them because it's not just about you know, doing the acupuncture just to treat them today or tomorrow. Like I, I learned this from Donna Keefe, another acupuncture is about preparing the palace and you're like getting your uterus and your reproductive area warmed up so that you can carry to term, you know, not just get pregnant. So a lot of times people are just spread thin, working their butts off, stressed to the max. Oh yeah, let's stick a baby in me. And so it's a a wake up time too. Like we're so out of balance. We need to chill out and kind of get back to balance before we can do this thing successfully. (laughs) Yeah. Oh my goodness. I let's have so many more conversations about that. If you're still open to it, that was a huge (laughs) assumption on my side about (laughs) this because I I don't know if you follow Sabine Wilms. She Uh is right. Me too. And um, I don't speak modern day Chinese or classical Chinese, but I still love her and I listen to her because of what she has to share. And she just made it so clear, you know, as 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 bizarre as it sounds, you know, 10 years after graduation, I still try to define what it means to be a Chinese medicine practitioner. And like every time someone asks me, a new question comes out, but she just helped clarify it for me. She goes, if you are here on this planet to harmonize heaven and earth, you are a Chinese medicine practitioner. And she goes, and then, Ooh, right? So that. easy. And I was like, yes, that's, that's, the, that's what I've needed is something so simple. And it resonates deep to my heart. Um, and so, yes, can, can we have more conversations about um, women's health, about even maybe the fertility journeys that you see as a clinician and helping both us as clinicians, but also, um, anyone listening to have a, a, maybe a different perspective from what they already know or what their friends went through, because I know that you have looked from, you know, all the different sides. It'd be really great to have those conversations. You know, what does it mean to balance heaven and earth and prepare for pregnancy and then be pregnant? And what does that balance look like? And 
on yes. and on. <laughs> yes, we can talk okay. about that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, are there any other, is there anything else you would like to share or and um, say regarding, I mean, I don't, I, I never want these conversations to end because I've just learned so much um, from you in our time here, but is there anything else you want to say or share before we close this one up? Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you've had a loss, I just want to say that, you know, I see you and I hear you and I, I'm so, so sorry for both you and your partner. Your partners suffer as much as the mamas do. And so, you know, even though that person might be your rock, that they still need a little bit of TLC too, and you guys are in it together. Um, just really being to yourself, self care, and 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 reaching out to your community at large, to getting support, to finding resources because there is support out there, and and you're not alone. Mm, thank you so much. And so, if people feel really um, connected and want to reach out to you, you already shared your email, which is so gracious of you. But you have a website or so? <laughs> any social media you want to plug? Yeah, people can find me on social media with Deb Davies, uh, Dr. Deb Davies on Instagram, Push San Diego on Facebook. Uh, Push San Diego is my current website. So anywhere you want to reach out, I'm happy to connect and support the women of the world. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We will, we will have another conversation soon. Thank you. Great.